worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. So shout out your praise. Let's join the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. So shout out your praise. Shout out your praise, God. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, this joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. So shout out your praise. Shout out your praise, God. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. So we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Yeah. 
Father, thank you, Lord, that, that we can have confidence, Father, that whatever it is that we might be facing, whatever it is that's on our minds and hearts as we come today, Lord, that, that we know that we have the victory in you. And Jesus has already won the battle. So, Lord, we put our faith, our trust in you again today, Father. I pray that you come and you pour your spirit out upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you for coming and thank you for the band who are leading us worship. And welcome too to those of you who are joining us online either now or later. Uh, before James comes to speak, Shiny is... God, oh, what a relief. <laughs> Shiny is going to come and read. <laughs> thank you. The reading is from Mark chapter 6, verse 45 to 52. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw his disciples straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Good afternoon. Um, I think a lot of you will know that this well-known story or a version of it is told in some other Gospels. We find it in John's Gospel. We also find it in Matthew's Gospel. 
And you might even remember that in Matthew's telling of this story, Peter gets out of the boat and he walks on water, doesn't he? Or he, he does for a little while anyway. And there are various theories as to why Mark has chosen to admit the Peter story in part of his narrative here today. But I kind of like one possible explanation for it, and it was offered up by A.T. Robertson, who was one of America's sort of foremost uh, Baptist scholars in the last century. He said this, he said, Mark does not tell of the incident of Peter's walking on the water and beginning to sink. Perhaps Peter was not fond of telling the story. And I was thinking, you know, if that is true, I can totally relate. So you can imagine it. You're one of the disciples. You've been on the boat with Peter, okay? Now you're all back safely on shore. You've got a fire going. There's a bit of fish on the barbecue. You're having a few beers. And for the umpteenth time, someone tells the story about how brave Pete got out of the boat and within a matter of minutes, he was floundering. He was gasping for air and he was going under the waves. And then there's howls of laughter and poor Peter is thinking, good grief, how many times do I have to listen to this story? Anyway, Mark doesn't tell the Peter story and I think that part of the reason that he doesn't is because he wants us to focus our attention on something else in this story. And the focus actually centers on just a couple of verses that aren't usually the verses that get our attention when we read this passage. Halfway through verse 48, Mark writes, he, that is Jesus, was about to pass by them. And it's right there. He says, shortly after dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, dot, dot, dot. So can we get a picture of that in our heads? The disciples have been straining at the oars for hours. There's this really strong wind blowing against them, and they're really struggling to make any kind of headway. Then... Jesus, who just seems to be walking across the lake like he's on a casual stroll, is about to pass right by them. Isn't that kind of odd? I mean, why would Mark include this specific detail? I, I'd suggest to you he hasn't included by accident, so he must have some reason for having noted that, to unambiguously state who Jesus is. In 1 Kings 19, we read how the prophet Elijah hears God speak, doesn't he? He speaks in a gentle whisper. But you know something? Before Elijah hears that still, small voice, he hears these instructions. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And do you remember how Moses, he's on Mount Sinai, and he said to the Lord, you know, Lord, how is anyone going to know that, uh, you know, you are pleased with me and that we're your special people and that we have your blessing? Well, Exodus 33 tells us that God responded to Moses with these words. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Mark wants us to know that Jesus is not simply miraculously walking on water. Mark wants us to be in no doubt that Jesus is, not only does Jesus' passing by on the lake, not only does that reveal the truth of his identity, but actually Mark takes it one step further because just as God told Moses that he would proclaim his name, which is almost unspeakable, but the Lord, the I am, the great I am, Jesus proclaims that same name because when the disciples on the boat cried out to Jesus, he says, take courage. It is I, the I am, the name of God. These words also are echoed, those that were spoken by God uh, to Moses out of the burning bush because when Moses said, what's your name? Who am I going to tell people, you know, sent me? God replies, it is I. I am who I am. 
Now, guys, maybe you have no problem believing that Jesus is God. But then as now, an awful lot of people do struggle with that. I'm reminded of that argument that C.S. Lewis put forward famously some years ago where he sort of said, look, there may be people that are ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but this bit about him being God, no, I don't buy it. And Lewis argued that Jesus is either who he claimed to be, or as you know how he argued, he, he said that either that or Jesus is crazy or demonic. Because if you think about it, if Jesus' claims for himself were false, if they were false, then surely it would be impossible for us to otherwise consider him either rational or morally credible. He really doesn't give us that option. And so while the fact that Jesus walked on water is incredible, and it's usually at the center of what we focus on when we read this passage, I just want to emphasize again the point that Mark is making. By including the reference to passing by, and also to the Lord's name, it is I, Mark wants us to be in no doubt about exactly who Jesus is. Jesus is God. Okay? Now the other part of today's reading to focus on comes at the end of verse 50. Mark says the disciples in the boat cried out because they all saw Jesus and were terrified. Why would the sight of Jesus, you know, their friend and their teacher, why would that terrify them? You know, if I had been asked to retell this passage from memory, I probably would have said something like, a strong wind came up on the lake. The disciples were really struggling against it to make any headway. The sea started to get rough. They, they became terrified. And then, whew, they saw Jesus walking across the water. But that's not what happened. According to Mark, the disciples were terrified only when they saw Jesus. So to be clear, the disciples see Jesus. I mean, he's just like trucking along. He's having a chilled out stroll on the lake. He's about to pass right by them, and they freak out and become absolutely terrified. I mean, why the, does that make sense? What's going on? Well, I'm no Greek scholar, but I did a bit of a Google search, and I discovered that the original Greek word terasso, that is translated here as terrified, actually elsewhere in the Bible, it's usually translated as troubled. It seems then that when we read that the disciples were terrified, they weren't experiencing sort of a wet your pants kind of fear. The Greek word that Mark uses suggests that they were desperately unsettled by what they saw. It'd be like you and me seeing something with our own eyes and just not being able to make sense of it. And being kind of disturbed by that and saying, did you, did, did I, did you just see what I saw? Do you know what I mean? Really quite unsettling. Now, to be fair to the disciples, you might remember that Mark says they thought that Jesus was a ghost. Now, the Greek word that he uses is phantasma, which means an apparition or a specter. And apparently, ancient Jewish tradition uh, taught that demons wandered the wildernesses and they wandered the seas. And so, perhaps the disciples just couldn't make sense of what they were seeing. Now, as I've already mentioned, the story of Jesus walking on the water appears in three of the Gospels. And each of them is slightly different. They don't all describe in the exact same way the uh, emotions and the fears that those disciples experienced. But you know something? There is one thing that all three of them agree upon, and it's this. When Jesus saw his friends, he said to them, don't be afraid. It is I. And there's an important message in this for us. Encountering Jesus might be scary. I confess I've always been more than a little bit unsettled by the words in Hebrews 10.31. It is terrifying to fall into the hands of the living God. But you know, once upon a time, the word terrible, terrifying, it was used to describe something that had great power something that was worthy of awe. 
And that's just the point that Mark is making. Our God is so awesome, so much greater than anything that we can possibly imagine or conceive of, that when we do meet him face to face, I think we're going to be quaking in our boots. Like the disciples when they came face to face with the living God who was walking on the water, I suspect that we'll have a profound range of emotions. Fear. Wonder. Incomprehension. Awe. But then, out of that indescribable presence, something that's beyond anything that we can conceive of, he will speak to us. He'll call us by name. And he'll say, don't be afraid. It is I. And then all will be calm. So maybe the next time you read the story of Jesus on walking, walking on the water, you'll remember that it isn't just another sort of notch in the miracles post uh, that Jesus performed. Perhaps you can read it and remember that it's an unequivocal affirmation that Jesus is God. And that it's also a foretaste of what it will be like to encounter him, the living God, face to face. Amen. Side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. So
Lord Jesus, I simply pray now that uh, each of us would be aware of you passing by. Each of us, like Moses and Elijah, would hear the promise that you will and the reassurance that we are safe with you then and forever. Pray that each of us would have by your spirit that deeper experience of you. Would you come by your spirit, Lord Jesus? Let us come by your spirit. still for the presence of the Lord the Holy One is here come bow before him now with reverence and fear sin him no sin is found we stand on a still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord, shine This place is moving in this place. 
far spoken word you were singing over me. So you've been so, so kind to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. been so, so good to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. All oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine, cause I could learn I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming death of God. your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so kind to me. I felt no worth, cause you paid it all for me, God.
That tore my heart to free and grace my fears really how precious did that. Shine. 